From the Thai Cats Audio Network, this is Speaking with the Enemy. Overcast conditions for tonight's Tiger Cats home opener against the Alouettes on the Thai Cats pregame presented by Greenworks. Bubba O'Neill and Andy Fantuz with you on the Thai Cats Audio Network. It's now time for Speaking with the Enemy presented by Red Tag. Seize the summer with Red Tag. .ca's flash sale and save up to 60% on select vacations to Cuba, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Hurry, hurry. Offer ends on June 24th. Certain conditions apply. Joining us from TSN 690 Montreal is former Alouettes All-Star Safety Turn Analyst Marco Briette. Marco Olivier, appreciate your time. Hey, happy to be here, boys. You know, coming off that week one win over Ottawa and a bye week, uh, any concerns over Russ going into week three? You know, I think the Owls, especially coming off of a victory, probably would have loved to continue with that momentum and play right away, but instead they have to sit out a week. The positive out of that is you did just go through three and a half weeks of training camp. You've got some bumps, you've got some bruises, so that gives you an opportunity to heal. But I think offensively, especially with the struggles that they had against the Red Blacks for three and a half quarters in that opening game, probably would have liked to have been on the field last week. What do you think the focus was in this week off to improve that area in the offense? Got to protect the quarterback. You know, they gave up six sacks against the Red Blacks. Now, the Red Blacks did have 2022 CFL sack leader Lorenzo Maldine, the fourth, who was in the Alouette's backfield all night long. Left tackle Nick Callender had his hands full. And it just seems like the Alouettes and Jason Moss and Anthony Calvillo didn't have an answer for that rush. I mean, they were going 70, 80 protection in the Red Blacks were only rushing four and still forcing for uh, Jardo to have to roll out and escape to the pocket uh, from the pocket to try and buy some time. So they need to shore up that offensive front and try and get Fajardo comfortable in the pocket early if they want to have some success in this football game. Well, you got to be impressed with the performance of the defense and the special teams last game with uh, just the amount of turnovers and the lack of Ottawa offense. Can you just speak a little bit about that? Yeah, and I think that's the product of defensive coordinator Noel Thorpe having a training camp under his belt. Now, last season, he came in a couple of games into the season, didn't necessarily have his personnel and his guys, didn't have that training camp to teach the foundation of his defense. Now, I spent several years playing under Thorpe, and I know the intricacies of his defense and how long it takes to pick that up, especially for a new guy. And I think we saw that on display in week one against the Red Blacks, where they were able to keep Ottawa out of the end zone. Five turnovers, including three interceptions on Nick Arbuckle. They did a tremendous job, and they're the reason the Owls won that football game. If we're looking at the lineup tonight here, I uh, see a few new faces. Boundary corner, KB and Ento. Tell me a little bit about him. You know what, he had a strong preseason and he was one of the guys that I felt had a good shot at making this football team. Interesting story from Ento. He was actually a receiver at the University of Colorado. Then he went, spent some time with the Green Bay Packers. They had the bright idea of moving him to the defensive side of the football. Now, he was one of those NFL guys who bounced around a little bit, played on a couple of practice roster, got cut a little bit, and found his way here to Montreal. But he played, he stayed at defensive back, played very well in the preseason, and now with Nafis Lyon, the boundary corner out of tonight's game with injury, Ento will get his first CFL career start in one of the toughest spots to play in the CFL on that boundary corner. He can probably ex expect a lot of action tonight. <laughs> What does Ento need to do to be able to switch his jersey number from 48, being a boundary <laughs> corner? <laughs> well, hopefully he has an INT bonus in his contract. <laughs> he can get a couple tonight, get a couple extra bucks, and pay someone off. But, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what number's on his jersey. As long as he gets the job done, hopefully he'll have a bright future here in Montreal. Sticking with the defensive backfield, uh, you and I were talking about Duquay, the free safety a bit, a position you know a lot about. Tell me about him. Yeah, he's been impressive since coming to the Alouettes. And one thing that, that's, that you know jumps out to me physically, and we were talking about it off air, was just how long this guy is. I mean, he's listed at 6'3", and I can tell you, he is all of 6'3". He's got tremendous reach, a good stride, able to close, 
and he's got really good football instinct. A lot of times you'll see him down making plays near the line of scrimmage, and they're not design plays where he's lined up in the box or close by. You know, he's up in the high post at 15, 17 yards away, but when he diagnoses the play, he trusts his instincts, he comes downhill and makes a play, and that's something that shows a lot of maturity and a high football IQ, especially for a guy who's only been in the league for a couple of years and only in his second year as a starter. Yeah, certainly a guy I love watching play and uh, uh, someone to keep an eye on, young, young Canadian talent out there. You talked about the offensive line struggles. What have the Montreal Alouettes done to you know, rem remedy that? Yeah, you know what? They're going to have to find an answer because it seemed like they tried everything against the Red Blacks, you know, bringing in double tight ends, trying to widen the rush, uh, bringing in extra offensive linemen. I mean, there were times where they had three fullbacks on the field at the same time, and they just couldn't find a way to protect Fajardo or give him time in the pocket. And then what that tells me is that it was probably an execution problem, just guys getting beat, guys not necessarily trusting their technique and getting the job done because there's no way a four-man rush should be hitting home against that 70 and 80 protection. Was there a little something to be said about Cody Ho maybe holding on to the ball a little bit too long? That was one of his criticisms with the Riders. Yeah, I think especially because that rush was getting to him early, it felt as though his eyes were dropping to the rush when his first read wasn't there, and he was worrying more about finding a way out of the pocket as opposed to finding a release valve or a check down throw down the field. And what we saw were sacks that resulted in big losses for the Alouettes. Fajardo was trying to lose ground and, and spin out of the pocket. And at one point, he has to have the, the presence of mind to just eat the football and take that three, four yard loss as opposed to that eight, nine, 10 yard loss, where now you're in a second and extra long and you got two options. You take a, you take a shot down the field to see if maybe you can draw a flag or you run screen draw. You know, I think second and 12 or 13 is a lot more manageable than second and 19. It, isn't it interesting when you, you look at a quarterback and you call it, you know, you might call it poise or demeanor in the pocket uh, and you see the difference in the, in, in, and I think it comes down to confidence like you talked about, about the quarterbacks who seem to see what's right in front of them and that's a big wall of 300 pounders on both sides of the line coming at them and, and all these bullets flying and the quarterbacks who kind of see past that and are just looking at the coverages and, and uh, the defensive uh, structure. Like you look at like a Zach Caleros and something and I think that's what makes him so impressive. Um, how do you, how do quarterbacks come out of that you know, quote unquote funk? You know, I think that getting an opportunity to watch the film and digest what was happening because the perspective on the field versus when you see the all 24 is completely different. And there were times where Fajardo, I think, in that football game was seeing ghosts. You know, uh, you know, I, I talked about how bad the Montreal protection was, but it wasn't bad all night long but there were times where it seemed like Fajardo was looking for a way out when he really didn't need one and so hopefully he's taking a look at that and he can realize that now hey maybe I'm not you know maybe the pressure wasn't as bad as I thought it was when the bullets were flying and we were on the field and that'll give him a little bit of confidence to stand in that pocket a little longer go to that second or third read instead of looking for a way out and pulling that pulling the shoot. Marco, we're kind of running out of time, but who, who should we be keeping an eye out for tonight? You know, defensively, I think you need to keep an eye on Avery Williams. I mean, last week, he was just all over the football, and it was no surprise why he led the Ottawa Red Blacks in tackles during his time there, year in, year out. He just has a nose for the football and, and a way to be around the play. And offensively, I think it'll be receiver Austin Mack had a breakout game against the Red Blacks, 120 yards receiving including a big catch on that first possession that led to Montreal's only touchdown of the night. It'll be interesting to see if he can replicate that type of success. Well, this has been Speaking with the Enemy, presented by Red Tag. Marco Briette, uh, our best to you. Your broadcast crew will call yourself a great game. Maybe the Owls win, maybe they don't. Well, I'm, I'm sure they'd love to have a win sitting atop the East at 2-0 early in this new season. Bon séjour, mon ami. Hey, merci, mon job. All right. Thank you.